filaments. And when they're pressed against the wall, they bend and they make huge contact with that wall. And it, it just feels very smooth and, and flat. But you can just, um, you can just stick things onto it. Ooh. <laughs> it's a prototype. OK. <laughs> no, it, it does work, actually. Oh, there it is. Yes. <laughs> so, so actually, the future could be that we have these amazing gloves. But there is one problem with that future. And I want to show you that problem with that future um, with this enormous piece of blue tack. <laughs> because this stuff you know, right? And you're thinking, blue tack, yawn. But it's actually as sophisticated as, as the gecko's foot because it works in the same way. You take a small piece of blue tack, right? And this is stuff is not sticky. It's not got adhesive in it, has it? You could, re you could infinitely reuse this stuff. It's not like a piece of sellotape, right? Or sticky tape where actually after a while it just gets full of, it loses its stick. So how does that work? Well, it's the same as the gecko's foot. You, it's, a, it's a material that becomes liquid when you put pressure on it, and that liquid flows into the mountains, the rough <coughs> mountains of this, of this surface, and then it maximizes the area of contact, uses the same adhesive forces, these surface weak adhesive forces, and sticks. You use this all the time, and it's the same as a gecko's foot. So that's fantastic. And then you think, well, OK, I'm just going to go home, and I'm going to just cover myself in blue tack. <laughs> I, know you, I know you guys, but don't do it. Because <laughs> from what you've learned tonight, you already know there's a problem, right? Which is that although the adhesive force goes up, if your, if your volume right, isn't matching that force, if your volume is going up quicker, then it's going to override it. So if you try and just stick this whole piece of blue tack, I'm putting pressure on it. I'm doing all the adhesive stuff. But this volume is very large, isn't it? So the, the force downwards is too big for that adhesive force. OK, so it's not, it's not an accident that geckos are small, right? <laughs> because they've got low weight. And it, it's all about this ratio, this surface to volume ratio. So we need something even better than geckos in order for us to be like Spider-Man. But I think we can do it. It's just a matter of time. OK, so fantastic. Now look, it's not, it's, it's, it's surface to volume ratio, and I will keep going on about it. But it really is absolutely crucial to your life. And no more so than this demo is going to show you. Here, under this here, I've got a model. And uh, it's a model of my lungs. Okay, <laughs> This is what my lungs look like. I'm going to put it exactly. There we go. Whoop. There we go. Whoop. No, there we go. Ha -ha. Now, I'm breathing in. And this is exactly what my lungs are the right size for me. So air is coming into these lungs. Now, would you believe that this is big enough? Probably not. When you're breathing in now, you're breathing a large volume of air. So if we all breathe in now, we're all breathing stuff into this kind of structure. Now, at that moment, breathe out, everyone. <laughs> Don't want you all fainting. Um, <laughs> at that moment you breathe in, your body has to extract all the oxygen it needs to be alive, right? So it's taking oxygen from a large volume, and it has to get into the blood vessels, which is a large area. So basically, it has to find a way of interfacing that large volume of air into all the blood vessels. And it does this by making these tiny little sacs, these alveoli sacs. And it, it spreads them all out in this kind of finagree way. And it's just like with the hamster, right? As you get smaller, these little sacs are like spheres. As they get smaller, their area in proportion to their volume gets larger and larger and larger. And that's exactly what you want. You want a large area to interface with the oxygen, right? Get the oxygen into your blood and to get the carbon dioxide out of your blood. So it's your own body is using the surface to volume ratio to actually just let you live. And I want to show you how big this area is that you need to live. Because you can't really see it here, because you're seeing it as a volume, right? But if you spread all these out onto a sheet, how big would that sheet be? Well, let me show you how big that sheet would be. <laughs> OK, we've got it here. All right, now I'm going to take this up. Am I? Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to let, I'm going to, basically, I'm going to try and spread this sheet out. This is a piece of silk that's the same area as my lungs. Would you believe it? It's, it's just inconceivable, isn't it, that all of this area could be inside your body. And I want you to pass this around. Is that possible? <laughs> yes. It's quite a nice experience being in my lungs, isn't it? OK, keep going, guys. Keep going. <laughs> keep, all right, so you guys let go. Just let it go. Let it go. My lungs, ladies and gentlemen. There, there's a small hole. You know when you spot the small hole? That's where I, I used to smoke. And essentially, that is what happens when you smoke. Your, your lung area gets smaller and smaller, and so you get out of breath. So if you get out of breath and you have lung disease, you get a smaller area in which to absorb oxygen. And that's, that's, that's the problem. So maximizing your area 
of your lungs is, is incredibly important to you. So, so this whole thing is incredible. Surface to volume ratio, right? Area to volume ratio is, is so important to you. It can help you survive jumping off a building, right? It can help geckos climb up walls. It can do all sorts of things. It's really integral to how you breathe and live. But it does something even more important than that, right? It can, it can determine whether you can dance or not. You're from Strictly Come Dancing, aren't you? Well, we're the choreographers of the, the show, yes. And, and what are your names? Chris, Chris Marquez. Marquez. Jacqueline Spencer. Oh, fantastic. Oh, you <laughs> dance so brilliantly. I'm Thank so you. envious. And in fact, I made some notes. And uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to run these past you because I kind of, I've come up with three rules, having watched you, about what you need to be able to do to dance. And I'll run them past you, if you don't mind. You can sort of critique them and see if I'm on the right track so I can Good. dance like you. All right, go ahead. Is that OK? <laughs> All right, so one of the rules to be able to dance is just to be able to stand. It yep. turns out that, I mean, you're standing now, and if you couldn't do that, that would be difficult, yep. wouldn't it? So Absolutely. that seems a prerequisite, doesn't yep. it? You've got to be able to stand. And then I noticed that you were kind of, you were sort of jumping from foot to foot, and there was kind of jigging around and stuff like that, and that seems to be a quite a lot of strength in your leg you needed. Yeah, you need to be able to kind of move your weight. Weight transfer in general is very important, obviously, to dancing, yes. Yes, OK. So, and, and, and you had to kind of be strong enough to pick up your partner. So that's Absolutely. also weight in the legs, isn't it? And yes, it's all, I mean, it all goes again, it's here. the legs, but very often you find that the whole tone in the body. <laughs> So standing up, strength, jumping. If yes. I can do those things, I can dance. Well, yes, with a bit of rhythm. <laughs> well, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on those rules for a bit now, and then we're, I'm going to come back to you at the end. But before you go, I just want to get the scores. Now. Ten. 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 Bring it on! <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, now, look. Standing. <laughs> that doesn't seem too hard, does it? But is it? Is it so simple as that? So I'm back to spherical animals because I'm, you know, basically if you ask a physicist to do anything, they'll end up start starting with a sphere. And so my model for an animal is a sphere, but this time legs. That's a step forward, isn't it? Literally. OK, so now I've got a spherical animal. Now all of its weight, right, has got to go through its legs, OK? So that means that these legs are like the um, pillars of a building, right? All of the force is coming through them. So the area, that cross-sectional area of those legs, is what's, is what's taking all the weight through there. So if that's small, then there might not be enough. Um, it, it, they've got to be strong enough to support this whole weight, OK? So if I take this animal, all of its weight's going through its legs, and it's standing on its own feet, right? It's got four legs, fantastic. Now, what happens when I size it up, right? I scale it up, I, I increase its width by two. So this is an animal exactly twice as big in proportions. So that means, as we know, that its volume has increased by eight times. So that means its weight has increased by eight times. But that would be fine if the area of its legs had increased by eight times. Then it would be exactly the same. But has, has the area of its legs increased? What do you think? No, no it hasn't. Because this area, this cross-sectional area, has only got four times bigger because of this whole problem. When you size things up, the surface-to-area ratio changes. So this, every one of the legs of this animal, has twice as much force running through it. And that means that it can't actually stand up, right? So the thing is, <laughs> you can't just keep getting bigger as an animal and not change your design, because sooner or later, you will collapse under your own weight. Now, you think this is, you know, you don't think that this kind of happens, but actually, this is what happens with elephants, right? Now, this is an elephant's leg of a juvenile from India. It's about six or seven years old. And you can already see, and we know this, don't we, that 
the, the ratios of the bones and the thickness of the bones have changed. Because this is the way out of the problem. If you change the ratios, if you make thicker legs, then you can support bigger weights. And that's what elephants do. They get their, may make their bones bigger, they make their legs bigger, because they actually are in trouble if they don't do that. So, I mean, Galileo recognized this very early on, and people have noticed this ever since. And in fact, if you look at elephants, you can immediately see it proportionally. They have much thicker legs, and they need it. Otherwise, they start to get into trouble with their kind of ability to hold up the legs. And if you look at big, even bigger things like dinosaurs, they have really fat legs, don't they? And it's not a style choice, OK? <laughs> What's the problem with having bigger, thicker legs? Surely that should make them stronger. So we thought, well, if we're going to talk about this, let's just get the strongest person we know and ask them. <laughs> and here he is. This is the strongest person I know. <laughs> and he is strong. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So what's your name? My name's Terry Hollands. And what are your strength credentials, just so we can all... I've been England's strongest...